hey, let's talk about emotions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Anton Texer. I'm licensed DEI trainer and consultant and uh, owner of Emotion Alliance. And this is Sherry Olander. She's also a licensed DEI trainer and consultant. And she's one of the main teachers at Empathy Academy as well. Hi, Sherry. Thanks for being with me today. Hello. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm too. Today we're going to talk about channeling emotions. And first of all, the thing that a lot of t people think about when they think of the word channeling is channeling spirits or like having some kind of disembodied spirit come into you and give you directions. Um, there are very well-known ones, but this is not what we're talking about at all. Totally not the same thing. <laughs> so channeling emotions is when you are listening to your emotions, you're feeling them, you are um, picking up on the message that they're bringing you, and then you are reflecting that back out into the world in a way that is respectful to both for both for yourself and for the people that you're interacting with. And this can look a lot of different ways. And the reason we're talking about today is because it is such a skill to develop. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of times I'll think about it with like the other use of the word channeling as if uh, you're directing water through a channel, you know, it's like you're, you're guiding the energy of your emotion to serve your best good. I hear you. Yeah, emotions bring a lot of energy with them a lot of the time, um, especially anger or emotions in the anger family can really do that. But well, honestly, any of the emotions like happiness can be like really happy. <laughs> and if you don't find a way to like channel it then it can feel overbearing to some people right or if you repress your happiness it can kind of come out in really weird ways too so I think that's a really good way of putting it thank you Sherry that's actually giving me this nice visual <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> that's funny I use that I um I talk about it in terms of the English channel <laughs> like it's a channel like you go through it. Yeah. We're setting, I used to have a farm and it, we like, you know, how to set up an irrigation system. And, you know, it's like, sometimes you can do that in garden beds just by digging trenches. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, this is, you know, this is the water I have here, which would be the emotion. And this is where I want to guide it to go. Yeah. Yeah. The thing with channeling, it seems like there's so many things that can get in, well, in my way, I don't know about your way, <laughs> but what I've noticed for myself lately is that since I'm not interacting with so many people face to face, I feel like my skills are getting rusty. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm, I don't have to be as, I don't know, um, emotionally hygienic. Ah, good turn. Usually because I have more time to myself, so I can can I can kind of like let my boundary get a little squiggly and like you know leave. I mean, like my office right now is a mess <laughs> because I'm a hugely visual person. You know, I like to see things, and there's no reason for me to clean it up right now. Absolutely, I understand. <laughs> I feel like maybe my emotions are kind of getting a little messy as well because I don't have to clean them up to for to fit into the different places I like to go because I don't have those places right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I think that's a good point. I was thinking about, you know, anticipating our conversation today and thinking more analytically about what is channeling mean, how to explain that and talk about it. And um, a big piece of it, I think, is just like the self-awareness, like without that self-awareness kind of um, part of it, it's channeling. It's, I don't know that you could do it um, at first without, just bringing awareness to what emotions are coming up, what the reasons are, you know, and, and it's when there's less kind of needs to be met, less people around whose boundaries you need to be mindful of as well as yours, it's less of a need to pay attention. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Although it, the, this also seems like it could be a really good opportunity to just practice because when you're channeling emotions, you really are relying on some of the other empathic mindfulness skills to help you know what you're feeling. So you need to be grounded because that helps you know what emotions you're feeling in your body and 
um, in your kind of personal space, right? Defining your boundaries is really helpful because it helps define yourself aside and it differentiates you from the outside world, you know, things that are not yours. And I think it, right, gosh, right now, if you're not defining your boundary, it's so easy to pick up on emotions and things going on in the outside world that are not yours. I mean, um, just reading the news can be, whoo, really intense. And social media, that's, there's plenty of uh, opportunity to practice on social media. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. If you are able to bring your conscious awareness to it, social media, yeah. Or watching a reality show. So, <laughs> Uh, Guilty Pleasure Watch right now is, uh, I think it's called Love is Blind on Netflix. It's this reality show where these couples, they're not couples. They're not couples yet. <laughs> these <laughs> singles in their 20s and 30s go and live in these two separate areas and then they get to meet each other in pods, but they don't get to see each other. And the whole objective, and this is what just like kind of blows my mind, is that they're supposed to get engaged and fall in love and get married all within like 30 days. Something ridiculous. So it's like totally preposterous. And um, I've just been watching this. And while I would never do something like that, I'm far too private a person to ever consider that. I am mm -hmm. totally getting wrapped up emotionally in this. And I'm thinking, Ancient, these are not your people. <laughs> you, don't, you wouldn't make friends with any of these people, but I can identify with it. And so I'm like feeling these emotions that are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm like kind of like going on this little roller coaster with them. So it's just been really fascinating. And um, also a good reminder uh, of like how important having a boundary is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm seeing too on the show is a lot of people aren't having good boundaries. I mean, you know, you don't know. Or as a woman, a lot of times you're encouraged not to have good boundaries. Sure. Yeah. But channeling. <laughs> Channel ourselves back to <laughs> channel ourselves back to channeling. Uh, I think the empathic mindfulness practices are so important as part of that because they help you know what your emotions are telling you. Yeah, I I remember like my first kind of experience with channeling when I first learned Carla's work was with anger specifically, um, and because I used to. Uh, not get angry you know i'd be pretty kind of like low-key but then when i would get angry it would be very sudden and intense mm. um and and i never you know kind of knew what to do about that never really thought about it too much um but when i read uh, language of emotions and about uh, the boundary setting process and the empathic mindfulness of boundary creating your boundary um and how anger is related to boundaries and how you can channel the energy that comes up with anger into a sense of um, separateness and boundary i started basically doing that um and often i'll think about it as um like a, a force field you know and i'm like a you know very sci-fi minded here <laughs> you know like channel like channeling energy uh into my force field so that i can remember that i'm separate and that i can have some space to to you know and so that was my first experience of channeling it was in relation to the um the boundary setting practice mm -hmm. yeah i think that the working with anger is one of the really powerful ways of practicing channeling because it, it demands that you make a separation mm -hmm. right? it demands that you set a boundary Whereas with some of the other emotions, for example, sadness, sadness is about release, right? But it's also about rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. And we don't think about, um, we don't think about like holding on necessarily. Although I know a lot of people who do, like <laughs> my, my other life, I'm a massage therapist and I can tell. <laughs> Right? People have the, their shoulders are by their ears. And one simple way of channeling your sadness is just to you know, just have a big whole body sigh. You're almost checking in with your body as you do that. And you're letting it go through your breath. And the thing about breathing, it's so important. It actually releases 70% of your body's waste through breathing. Wow. I know. 
I mean, I, um, so that's always kind of highlighted to me how important it is. Just keep breathing, gosh, but also <laughs> how, how your breath affects you on so many levels. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't think about your breath affecting you emotionally necessarily, but just sighing can be really relaxing, but it can also help you flow with your emotions and let go of what is done or what you don't need anymore. And that's a, that's a form of channeling. Mm -hmm. I've definitely been doing a lot of sighing these days and, <laughs> and it's good because I know what's happening. You know, when I have these big frequent sides, it's like, well, yeah, there is a lot to let go of on a daily basis right now. Right now, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, another thing that I was thinking of with channeling is really it's about, for me, um, engaging with the emotion. Like, I think, you know, kind of leaning into it in most cases uh, as a way of, um, Either, you know, um, I think with expression, often there's this sense of like letting it move me or, you know, in whatever way comes out, just kind of um, uh, reactive, I suppose, um, unconsciously reactive. Um, as a, And then, or, or repressing where, you know, I'm pushing it away. Um, but with channeling whatever emotion it is, I think there's a leaning into it. It's It's like okay, I feel sadness, let me, let me, you know, e like you said, either do a sigh or maybe there's something deeper. Maybe there, you know, I need to kind of think about like what, why is this feeling coming up for me? What's going on underneath? Um, yeah. Yeah. Does that? You make a good point about leaning in. It is really about listening to what's going on underneath. And it, really bring such clarity oftentimes, right? Just, just acknowledging the truth of what you're feeling, just acknowledging I'm sad because I can't go out and see my friends. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I'm, <laughs> I'm frustrated because I'm doing the same five things every day. <laughs> <laughs> But that knowledge lets me know, like, oh, well, you're doing the same five things. Do something different. Just do anything different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Oftentimes, I find verbalizing how I'm feeling can mm -hmm. really help me uh, bring it from unconscious to conscious awareness. Yeah. Right? Emotions are so unconscious so much of the time. Right? They, and I think that for the most part, they should be in the sense of um, they guide us very intuitively to what we need to do. But it's when we've trained ourselves to not listen to our emotions or to, re to repress our emotions or just to express them like willy nilly that that's what it's really good to re retrain ourselves to become conscious of like, oh, I'm really frustrated right now. What can I do with this? What is this really about? Right, you can ask yourself the questions for anger. Mm -hmm. What do I value? What must be protected and restored? And then, and then you have like a grounding point for going forward. And that's, I mean, this is what channeling really asks you to do. It, like you're saying, it asks you to lean in, to be open to listening to the truth of what your emotions are telling you instead of what you think they should be saying or sh what you think you should be feeling or not feeling. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's one of the things that's most difficult is, especially for me, I'm really good at holding onto the shoulds and the supposed tos. Like <laughs> I am a 38 year old woman. I should be this by now, right? I should be here or I should look like this or whatever. Yeah. Right? yeah. Whatever kind of thing my subconscious has picked up. And I'm really good at, re at repressing what I think I should not be feeling. Yeah. So leaning in is a concept that I love, but it's also this like really sometimes painful process of uncovering more kind of shaming contracts mm, right? or, you know, outdated contracts, um, just old ideas. And yeah. uh, 
in a way for me, it's been like therapy, like, all right, let's pause through, through some past stuff again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it is. It's, you know, like doing therapy for yourself uh, when you can, because I, I, you know, made a comment one time um, in one of the classes about how our emotions are really the only um, witness that has been to our lives that has been with us the entire time. You know, our emotions kind of reflect a truth uh, or, or um, hold a truth about our entire existence and all of our experiences in a way that no other person or even our own kind of intellectual awareness can. And it's having that kind of record, you know, um, to be able to go back and be like, oh, well, this is where this came from. This is why my anger does this. And, oh, hi, fear. I know why you pop up in these situations because, because look, this happened back then. And, you know, it's, uh, it can be fun, but yes, it can also be painful and <laughs> difficult. I, what you're saying is, is really beautiful for me to hear that. And um, it's funny, I, I've been thinking about it as like your emotional lineage. Yeah. Is, you know, you, it's almost like you can trace it back like a family tree of emotions back there. And like, oh yeah, fear was not allowed when I was a kid. So I am welcoming it back in now. <laughs> yeah, I like that emotional lineage. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful way of putting it. That your emotions have been witnessed to you for your entire life. And they do, they hold your history. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I think we're so, um, we're so used to kind of relating to each other and even in, to ourselves on such a surface level, you know, even, not to say being superficial or anything like that, although that happens too, but, you know, we're such rich, complex human beings. I, I always think of um, the humans of New York, store, uh, um, project, I guess. Um, and every single person he, he comes across has just, just, you just, you know, after like five or six questions, there's this beautiful, like depth that, that you can see. And, um, but we don't usually do that, right? We don't usually go there. We usually just kind of, but there's, we're just so like beautifully complex. I, I just, it's really amazing getting all philosophical. <laughs> I love it. I, um, <laughs> oh, it'd be fun to sit down. I think that's the thing. I think that, yeah, sitting across from somebody is much more intimate than staring at a computer screen. <laughs> anyway, we're totally getting sidetracked here. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, I have a question. Maybe you have an insight about this. What kind of, um, do you have any advice for someone who feels really resistant to working with their emotions, listening to them, channeling them to, to even the thought of leaning in, which, um, by the way, that book leaning in by Sheryl Sandberg was actually really be beautiful in the way that, uh, that's where the uh, concept came from, I think. Oh, cool. I think she wrote it in 2013 or so. Um, and it was essentially just saying, uh, feel into what you are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And instead of running away from what you are afraid of, like theoretically afraid of, like just look into it. And it's kind of a Pemba Chodron philosophy mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, invite it in see what it's all about. Yeah. I remember um, a, a therapist once told me, uh, which sounds along the same lines, like to kind of bring in curiosity as a way of, uh, you know, approaching things from a curiosity standpoint helps, uh, I think, interrupt some of that uh, resistance or fear or whatever it is that's preventing you from um, exploring. It, it kind of changes the perspective. Um, yeah, it's funny because curiosity is, is like a soft fear. Right. Like, what is this thing? Yeah. This is making me wonder if resistance is like a kind of a form of soft panic. Mm. Kind of like a, oh, no, I need to protect myself from this scary thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that idea. 
Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see. I I work with with resistance all the time, so I'll do some research here. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure, like, I'm trying to think if there's, if I would have any kind of suggestions besides the curiosity thing. Um, I, I suppose I've always, I don't know, for me, I think it's hard because I've always been so introspective that I've, like, I've always wanted to figure out why, of why do I feel this way? Why do I think this? Like, and it, so I'm so used to kind of self-excavating that, um, that the resistance to that or, you know, resistance to wanting to do that uh, is kind of foreign to me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, just off the top of my head, I'm like, okay, so what, are the, what would that be like? Um, something I have kind of realized recently for me, which may be helpful um, in, in this conversation, is uh, in terms of repression, like I've, I've realized that often when I repress an emotion, there is a a sense of kind of self-abandonment or inauthenticity that mm -hmm. accompanies it. Um, and so I, I want maybe, you know, I wonder about bringing in the question, like do you, into somebody who is say resistant or, or for whatever reason, for whatever emotion is causing that feeling, whatever, it's probably a mix, right? Um, but uh, I would say, you know, does that, what feels, most true what, what feels most authentic uh you know or kind of bring in that question of like what would help you be more authentic or something like that i like that it feels like it is um pointing another arrow at the root of the cause of the resistance which is usually in my experience some kind of a outdated contract mm. right it's something that's or you know it's unrealistic or mm. it's some kind of a contract that just doesn't fit your life anymore or if, if it ever did right and now you're i'm just you know awake enough to finally notice it like pinpoint it and you <laughs> <laughs> yeah you see yeah. you so one of the things i've started doing is just noticing when i'm feeling resistance and then there's and, and then turning my spotlight onto the resistance mm -hmm. rather than just reacting. Yeah. And one thing I was thinking before when you were talking about how your, your focus has been on self-excavation, which by the way is a totally great visual. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, your focus is on, uh, your priorities are more about learning about yourself rather than protecting what like your idea of yourself mm -hmm. and that is um a distinct a very important distinction mm -hmm. I think, because i think resistance is about protecting this idea you have of yourself yeah <clears throat> what, and you know i just want to bring in a point to kind of clarify that we're not um we're not saying that resistance is always something you should get over because sometimes it's there for a very good reason, right? And it's okay to, um, it's hard to kind of uh, verbalize like, you know, when it's good or when it's something that should be challenged maybe. But um, when you were saying it, um, you know, sometimes you're, you finally are awake enough to kind of realize that, that there's, maybe you should turn your attention to the resistance. I also, it, it popped into my head that some, and sometimes you have to wait until you're safe enough, right? Because a lot of those, a lot of those old contracts come up for very good reasons. And if you're, you know, your psyche knows that you don't quite have enough security in, in place, uh, it might bring up resistance to, to prevent you from, from excavating, you know what I mean? Like if you don't have a team to kind of, you know, use the metaphor, further if you don't have a team to like you know build scaffolding and whatever you know <laughs> to go to go deep <clears throat> it the resistance might be there for a very important reason thank you for bringing that up it's it's so true i guess i think of the psyche is very capable of kind of protecting itself in that way mm -hmm. um whether through resistance or distraction or dissociation and those are my favorite. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're great. Distraction. Um, weren't we just talking about a TV show earlier? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I think that there's something very intuitive about um, the way our emotions work in that we, we recognize oftentimes when it's not safe mm-hmm. to, uh, to be ourselves, to, to be our authentic selves or to, um, or to do deep internal personal work. Right. Um, and like right now in the world, it might be a good time or it might not be a good time depending on where you're at. And, um, and, you know, depending on what your resources are, it's very true. I mean, oh, I'll just say it's been a process for me of getting used to um, living with my husband and my two-year-old all day long, every single day. And um, it's been totally exhausting. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> I bet. <clears throat> so for, uh, like, the last... I don't know, six weeks, I really haven't had the resources to deal with stuff. It's just been like, okay, now we're putting the two-year-old to bed. Now I'm going to go to bed and it's going to start over again tomorrow morning. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So as we've, but as we've become more comfortable and as we've developed more of a routine and as, mm, as my emotions have become less in on the intense side of things and more moderate and more soft then. Now I'm at the point where I can start kind of waking up and looking again, Mm -hmm. right? I'm not so much in a survival mode. And so, yeah, resistance is there for a reason. It's like, it's there to protect you for sure. When you are awake enough to notice it, then that might also be part of you saying, oh, hey, let's, let's take a look at this. Yeah. We are safe. We're stable enough that um, we can do, with a little shaking up of, you know, who knows what we might unearth here. Right. Yeah. And that shaking up a lot of times, you know, if, if people aren't, are just learning about their emotions, that kind of sudden like influx of different emotions at pretty intense levels um, can seem like, Oh no, something must be wrong. But a lot of times it's just, no, things are finally right enough that you can, you can, you know, deal with all emotions. emotions. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. space for them finally Hmm. yeah emotions are wise they i mean our bodies uh, to a certain extent our bodies are, are our emotions like we hold them in our bodies our bodies express our emotions whether we are conscious of it or not uh we will repress our our emotions into our bodies in different areas. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we are our emotions Mm -hmm. and what all we're trying to do in DEI is make that a conscious process rather than an unconscious process. Yeah. Kind of realign the, the, the systems or the pieces of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And channeling is, essentially you're just in this process of kind of like making sure that there, all these things are in alignment, right? So that the emotion doesn't have the, the hiccups or the, okay, it doesn't, it didn't get sidelined into repression this time because you had an old contract that said all anger was bad, right? Okay. So you took care of that one. Now I'm going to go this way. <laughs> like, Oh, I feel angry or I'm frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was really realizing too, like a lot of times um, what we do with or how we um, act or not or don't act in response to emotions can look like repressing or expressing. Um, But it's that middle piece of just kind of bringing in the awareness and asking the questions that is makes it a conscious choice Um, so that, you know, if we're, you know, it, with a friend and we feel sad and we know the friend is understanding and, and, you know, it might be okay to just cry and break down, um, you know, where is that probably wouldn't be okay for most people to do in work, you know, uh, at work, for example. But um, so like, is that expressing, is crying expressing sadness? Well, yeah, but, you know, it was also channeling because they, they were able to recognize that that's what, their emotion was calling for and their body was calling for it and then decide, okay, this is a good time to do that. (laughs) You know, this works now.
Right, right. It's not like overwhelming you to the point where you have no control. Right, when you're channeling your emotions, you are aware and you do have more say about how you choose to express it, whether crying feels the best way or maybe you want to make a really sad picture or maybe you want to go for a walk and commune with the raindrops. Um, something you said also reminded me of witnessing. Mm. You're bringing awareness to your emotions and in a way you are witnessing your own emotions. So you're, you're really seeing yourself. Yeah. Like you're yeah. seeing and validating yourself for what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's a really beautiful process. It's such an important process for us to see ourselves for who we are, to, for us to be seated in the present of who we are and how we're feeling rather yeah. than the shoulds. <laughs> <laughs> Me and, you know, half of the world, well, who knows how much of the world, a lot of the world. You know, many more, much more than half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it's just um the way that you said it was really beautiful the, that the difference is that you are aware of your emotions and in a way your emotions or you are witnessing your emotions so you are you're witnessing yourself and in that way do you think that channeling your emotions is kind of going through an initiation each time you do it yeah, I like that idea. Um, and I was, you know, it's like an extreme, almost um, in today's society or in our, you know, kind of anti-emotion culture, it's like a rebellious act of self-compassion to, to, you know, to challenge our emotion or to channel our emotions. Um, and uh, yeah, I like that. I mean, yeah, that's beautiful. I really enjoyed talking about resistance and and looking at it from from an emotional perspective. The way that resistance is something that can is there to take care of you for some reason. You know, it's, it's, it believes it's there to protect you, mm -hmm. and it does do a good job of protecting you um, until it doesn't. Yeah, you reminded me of my thought. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and just it, in terms of a lot of times, the the reason people repress their emotions is because there's this underlying belief that it's going to be too painful or too much or what too too whatever you know. And um, and so when we feel them, there's an an, an in, uh, immediate kind of reflex to to resist. Um, but a lot of times it's the resistance itself that is the most uncomfortable and painful. <laughs> Whereas if we just let the emotion do its thing, then it doesn't end up being as, um, as um, arduous uh, or painful or, you know, or whatever, insert any miserable adjective, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, I think about that video of the, the little boy in the back seat who's crying, listening to his song, and his dad's like, are you okay? And he's like, he was fine. He was, you know, experiencing his emotion, and it was fine. Um, and uh, in terms of channeling, I, I know often with the intense emotions, um, more like the guest China emotions, like grief and um, and panic, of course, like a lot of times – they kind of go into uh they start like the, it's sometimes so fast that there isn't so much a conscious kind of choice to, to go with it but but once it's there to know that it's okay that it's there and and to just kind of ride it out um that has been really helpful for me and that you know in, in my experience like with grief specifically i'm thinking of like I thankfully had found Carla's work before I had this kind of intense period of grief in my life. And, um, and knowing that it's like, that it was, that's what's supposed to happen. This is, you know, that just to trust to trust the emotion. So when it would come up, I would just lean into it and let it do its thing. But sometimes it would come up before I 
you know, it would just kind of, it would kind of just start without me. (laughs) And then I'd be like, okay, this is what we're doing. (laughs) And that's okay too, sometimes, you know. That's really beautiful, the way that you just talked about that as, um, yeah, being able to lean into the process and trusting your emotions. I think that as a culture, we've been taught not to trust our emotions. Yeah. You know, that we have to hide them, that we have to master them, control them. And uh, good luck. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, um, that's a really hard way to live. Because if you're trying to control your emotions, then you're trying to hold on, right? And you're not welcoming sadness to, to help you let go and release and rejuvenate. Like, it's really important process of letting your emotions flow. And sadness is so key for that. But if you're, you know, if you're trying to hold on, if you're like putting yourself in this box, you're like, okay, I'm going to be this kind of person. Whew, it, is, it takes a lot of energy to do that. And then your emotions are wrapped up trying to tell you things and and do other things. So it just takes a whole lot of energy and uh, it ends up being exhausting Mm -hmm. trying to be somebody who you're not trying to fit into some other kind of a container than how you feel and then what you are. And I mean, I think that a lot of people tend to go to apathy if they don't feel safe with their emotions. They're like, well, if I, if I can't do this and whatever, I'm just not doing it. Right. Or they go into numbness. Yeah. And, I mean, I've been both of those places for, for sure, for years. Yeah. <laughs> in my 20s, for sure, where I just wasn't, I wasn't able to trust myself. Um, I didn't know that I could. I didn't, I didn't have any role models in my life where emotions were welcome. Right. I mean, I grew up doing, um, being very athletic and doing sports that were, Fairly macho, fairly like, uh, pain is nothing. <laughs> Just keep going. Yeah. Right? But um, that didn't serve me so well. <laughs> because if you're feeling pain, a lot of pain, uh, then that is a message. Just like emotions, when they get intense, they really have a message for you. Right. right. If you don't listen, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Um analogy like the way the body works and the the emotions work it's like well (laughs) yeah it's simple but it is not necessarily easy to follow right yeah that's a better way of saying it (laughs) (sighs) sherry thank you for having this conversation with me yeah thank you this is great gonna take some of these take some of these quotes and make them into little memes <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea yeah, I, I, think, I have to think about trying to do that but it doesn't it never makes it to the, to the top of the list <laughs> priorities right yeah no i understand it's just about what's actually important to you rather than what sounds like a good idea mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah thank you